Hi, I'm Tom, W8JI. I'm going to do a little something on beverage receiving antennas here. I've been using beverage antennas since around 1970, and um, uh, I'm going to do a um, how I construct the antenna and a little bit of um, how the antenna works. First, uh, I want to show you how W1AW sounds here as I change directions on a beverage array. And going back to north, the signal levels are about the same as they are going east. So uh, this is the pattern of that particular beverage array. It's uh, two beverage antennas that are broadside, about 350 or 360 feet apart broadside, and about 800 feet long lengthwise for each antenna. Because of the nature of contesting where multiple receivers and transmitters are operating at the same time and also uh, more because I like to experiment with receiving antennas and that requires comparing one antenna to another antenna while both antennas are operational over a long period of time, I have a lot of antennas uh, scattered around. The ones far in the back that you see on the map are primarily reference antennas that are, are untouched um, except for maintenance and they give me a basis to compare any new antennas or different arrays, uh, any changes in the array. I can immediately compare the signal to noise ratio to see if I've done anything to improve the, um, uh, the receiving system here. Because I have so many antennas and because uh, it would be impossible to keep up with everything if I, if I didn't um, make them as reliable as possible, I've, and also inexpensive, you know, it, nobody wants to spend a whole lot of money on, uh, on uh, antenna systems when you don't have to. So because of that, I've come up with a lot of ways to do things that make the system more reliable and easier to maintain, easier to install, and easy to, um, uh, to maintain over time. And I'd like to share some of that with other people. You want to avoid uh, uh, real thin, flimsy insulators or these real long uh, uh, nail-in insulators that have just the little tabs on the end. Uh, they have a tendency to, uh, to uh, split or break over time. Uh, especially if there's any uh, tension on the uh, on the uh, wire that you use to make the beverage antenna. This type of uh, egg insulator, uh, strain insulator, is a good uh, uh, insulator for the end of the beverage antenna when you properly install it. This is much more solid and, and uh, thicker material than the first insulators uh, that I showed and uh, you can put an awful lot of tension on these uh, insulators. They're even good for HF transmitting antennas. Uh, it's a good cheap way to have a reliable insulator in a transmitting installation. So they're not just for beverages. And these are really good uh, post type insulators. You can nail these into the sides of trees or uh, into wooden posts or pressure treated uh, lumber that you uh, might use to uh, support the antenna along the length. Um, these are very reliable uh, insulators. I usually put a little stainless steel metal washer out on the end of them and uh, tap the nail uh, up against the, uh, the washer. That kind of spreads the load out so as the tree grows and it pushes on the uh, insulator it'll push the insulator, sometimes it'll push the insulator right back up out of the tree a little bit and it um, it prevents the nail from sucking down into the uh, insulator as the tree grows. 
an insulator like that mounted on a tree will look uh, something like this. Notice that uh, when I run the beverage wire, I use 17 gauge uh, galvanized uh, electric fence wire. I used to use copper weld wire, which is uh, fairly expensive, but in, uh, in uh, AB comparisons between the two and measurements of current along the length of the wire, I decided that the copper weld was a was a just a needless waste of uh, money, so I used regular 17 gauge galvanized steel um, uh, fence wire for my uh, beverage antennas. But look, if you look at it closely, you see that I float the wire across the insulator. I put the insulator um, uh, snap area up vertically and just uh, push the wire down through the snap area and let it lay on the insulator. I make no effort at all to tie the wire to the insulator. That's just a long-term disaster if you do that. Where trees aren't available, uh, I'll use a regular rigid uh, half-inch or three-quarter inch conduit, uh, a rigid conduit and uh, galvanized rigid conduit and I'll drive a piece of uh, PVC, regular PVC pipe that just uh, fits over the conduit or inside the conduit tightly and I'll cut notches in a PVC pipe but again I let the I let the wire, the antenna wire just floats across these prop poles. Uh, these I use a lot of these prop poles where the antenna has to cross fields and I have to be able to drive underneath it with my tractor or with my truck and uh, a 10 foot piece is um, absolutely fine for 160 and 80 meters. It, it starts to deteriorate a little bit on 40 meters at, at 10 feet but it still is pretty good on 40 meters so you, you um, can uh, do this simple system and then at the bottom of the uh, conduit instead of digging a hole or something in the ground or try to pound the conduit into the ground what I do is I just buy some rebar, a few, a few feet of rebar and I just pound the rebar in the ground and set the pole down over the rebar and this, this works out really well and uh, it holds up over a long period of time. Where I have uh, wires that have to cross uh, out in a field and there's a bunch of spots like that uh, I'll use one of these prop poles and uh, I cut notches in the side of uh, PZ, PVC pipe and also uh, like a V-notch in the top of the PVC pipe and the wire just sits in these uh, notches and so this is um, a, a reliable way of having the wires uh, cross and again the wire just can slip uh, in the uh, in the pipe so it's this is really nothing but a prop pole. It doesn't uh, there isn't any attempt at all to uh, uh, laterally support the wire. It just uh, keeps it up off the ground and it sits in a groove. Now, in some cases uh, where you have a real long span and the wind's blowing sideways on it, uh, you may um, uh, want to use something a little bit more rigid and so occasionally you can use a post that's made out of pressure treated 2x4 to keep it from uh, warping uh, what I do is I make a T post out of it I'll nail the uh, uh, the uh, edge of one 2x4 to the face of another 2x4 and uh, of course if you look at it endwise uh, it looks just like a T and then you can use these the regular um, uh, nail type or screw type uh, fence insulators that you would use on trees or wooden posts and use those insulators to support the wire where it crosses the uh, 2x4 post. So this is a this is a good method but it, it requires it's a little bit expensive and it requires um, boring a hole in the ground or digging a hole in the ground to support the post. The end insulators of the antenna are particularly important because they're really what has the bulk of tension. So the antenna itself should float through all the uh, support insulators along the length of the antenna and only be tensioned from the very ends. And so uh, 
the best thing to do is to use a conventional um, serving wrap on the uh, on the uh, end insulators and use the strain insulators or compression insulators the way they're designed to be used so that the wire um, goes through the hole and lays over most of the body of the insulator instead of coming off the short side. You don't want the two holes to pull each other apart. You want the two holes to be in compression and, and be trying to uh, push the insulator together. Step in any of this is uh, to put the wire through the insulator correctly and get the free end, the tail uh, coming out of the insulator, uh, to uh, wrap around the load bearing end or the antenna wire itself. The antenna wire should go straight into the insulator and just the, uh, the free end of it wrap around the load bearing wire. Start up close to the body of the insulator and wrap the free end around the load bearing end uh, uh, tightly so that the load bearing end runs straight into the insulator rib and the free end uh, comes off in a pigtail that you can solder to. It doesn't matter what the style of the insulator is, um, but no matter which one, you should wind up with a wrap that the antenna itself is pulling straight on the eye of the insulator and you wind up with a little pigtail that you can solder to. This will keep you from ruining the, um, uh, the galvanizing or the coating on the antenna wire um, and um, it'll make it a whole lot easier to deal with this thing. You won't have problems uh, getting rust or any kind of uh, uh, weakening the uh, wire itself that is bearing a lot of the load. I cite the path uh, through the fields or trees that uh, wherever the beverage is going to run carefully using a sighting type of uh, compass. If you get a good sighting compass like people in forestry will use for uh, casual um, uh, surveying, you can get within a, a few feet over a distance of several hundred feet. So it's, while it's not imperative that the beverage be exactly perfect in line, you really don't want the thing to uh, meander off course and, and uh, wind up pointing uh, 10 or 15 degrees off from your target direction. You especially want the beverage lined up if you're going to use two of them in a pair and phase them together. This is a path uh, through the uh, woods with one of my northeast beverages and uh, most of my beverages are around 800 feet long because I primarily work 160 meters. So um, uh, the, I found this to be a very good length. Going uh, longer doesn't do very much more for it and, and so it's sort of the, uh, uh, the optimum maximum length uh, before you really need to break over and use a uh, second beverage in a, at, uh, to uh, narrow the pattern even more. Uh, so this is all lined up with a sighting compass and I work my way through the woods and I just clear an area enough, uh, just enough of an area that I can get through there and uh, maintain the path for beverages for that beverage in the future. I generally go through the insulator with a tensioning wire uh, and the tensioning wire I'll like anchor it to a tree or to a pole and uh, into a pressure treated 4x4 four four or something on, at the end of the antenna to pull against and so I'll go around the tree go up through the insulator with the wire and then back to the tree or to the pole again and to tension the antenna when I have both ends of it secured like this to tension the antenna I pull on on one of the two one of the two wire ends that goes through the insulator and I pull there because that gives me a two to one mechanical advantage that, that those insulators are pretty slippery 
So if you pull on the wire with one hand, with uh, you can pull real hard on the wire and tension the antenna uh, really tight just by pulling and rocking on the insulator a little bit. You can you can slip the insulator and pull really tight uh, that way, and then anchor the second end back around the pole or back around the tree. When I say I slip the wire through the insulator, this is what it looks like. And uh, you can see the looped wire there that goes over to a pole or over to a tree. And what, then when I, uh, uh, I'll anchor one end of the wire and then pull on it uh, as hard as I can pull. And then when I get the antenna nice and tight, then that I'll wrap it around the tree and secure it or, the, or a pole, whatever I happen to be using at that end. But this is how it slips through the insulator. These insulators being plastic uh, are slippery enough that they really don't, uh, it really lets the wire slide through the insulator as you tension it this way. I use flexible wire for my down leads from the beverage at both ends. Uh, I, I, what I do is use like a number 18 or 20 gauge uh, stranded uh, wire that's a, a fairly good wire. Usually I use some old Teflon hookup wire I have laying around and I bend the hook in the tailing end of the beverage and I start out doing this and then I can I can wrap the stranded wire around the end of the beverage. One of my soldering techniques is to wrap a solder around uh, over top of the of the uh, wire wrap where I've wrapped it around the tailing end of the beverage. So I'll wrap a few layers of solder right around uh, over top of the whole thing and then I'll heat it with a uh, torch and I'll heat right on top of the solder until I heat that whole tailing end up and the solder flows down in and makes a connection to the uh, uh, to the beverage. So you wind up with a nice flowed joint, and you don't heat up the the um, uh, the galvanized end of the beverage too much, uh, because that'll cause rust. It'll take some of the galvanizing off, and then it'll rust there. This gets a better connection without um, without making it susceptible to rust later on. When I'm all done soldering it, then the next step is I take the tailing end of the new wire that I added, the new flexible wire, and I do a knot around the uh, uh, end of the beverage and I pull that knot uh, tight. I do this so that there's no back and forth wiggling or strain or anything when the wind blows and the antenna moves and or uh, anything causes the end of the antenna to shake. It isn't constantly working on the wire and and flexing the solder joint because stranded wire will break real easy right at the point where you solder it. So if you uh, if you do something like this with a knot at the end, it'll last a whole lot longer. Rather than soldering to ground rods, which I use uh, I initially used to do that. Um, instead, now I just take a drill out, and after I put the ground rod in the ground, I um, drill a hole through the uh, ground rod and put a number 10 screw uh, with a good stainless, uh, passivated stainless hardware setup, and uh, I use a wing nut on it and sandwich the uh, the wires through a uh, uh, against a pair of uh, flat washers, and I'll use this split ring tensioning washer to keep tension on the uh, joint. I put a little bit of uh, dielectric grease um, like you get at automotive stores as uh, dielectric tune-up grease or whatever. Uh, I put a little bit of that underneath uh, all the connections uh, and uh, that keeps, uh, that minimizes any uh, corrosion problems. This particular ground rod uh, here that you're looking at is a um, is a half inch copper pipe driven in the ground, and it's probably been out there 15 or or 15 years or so I would say, 
and uh, it's even been hit a few times with the uh, bush hog when I've been back mowing the field. So this stuff holds up real well if you do it right. It doesn't hurt to have the OX or OY series metal composition resistors. Don't use a metal oxide and don't use a carbon resistor uh, because uh, they're susceptible to uh, moisture and to lightning damage. Uh, but these, uh, these OX and OY type uh, resistors uh, that, are, that are a metal composition type are very reliable. They can be exposed directly to the weather. It doesn't hurt them a bit. And uh, they'll handle a, a lightning surge uh, really remarkably well. You can solder them right to the pigtail of the beverage like this as long as you use that solder wrap method. Uh, that I showed earlier uh, for the flying connections like would come down to the beverage transformer itself um, and uh, as long as you heat the resistor lead and the solder and don't get the galvanized area too hot hot enough to flow but not so hot that you start to burn the galvanizing off then uh, you can have a joint that will hold up a long time with regular solder It'll hold up a long, long time, uh, many years outdoors, and not deteriorate, and you really won't have any rust forming around the joint if you do it all correctly. If you ever have to splice a uh, antenna wire, you can do it this way. This is called a Western Union splice, and you uh, uh, wrap the uh, flying ends around the uh, other wire and uh, do that with both of them and then you leave a couple tailing ends uh, just like this on the wire then you take those tailing ends and you can twist them with a pair of pliers and that'll keep this thing from coming unraveled if you uh, you can pull on this thing and a joint like this will be just as strong as the wire itself is Another technique I use to uh, splice wires is I'll get a little piece of copper tubing that's big enough that both wires can, uh, both ends of the wire can freely fit through it. And I'll put the antenna wire through the copper tubing from opposite directions and then bend the hook in the wire so that the wire uh, uh, hooks on the uh, tubing. And then I'll heat the tubing with a torch and flood the tubing with uh, solder. I'm, I'm careful to heat only the copper tubing and not the galvanized wire so that I don't damage the galvanizing. Another technique I've used is a piece of copper tubing that's just barely bigger than the, uh, than the uh, wire and uh, I've put uh, solder inside the copper tubing and, and pushed the ends of the antenna up into the copper tubing and then heated it and uh, flow soldered it this way. Uh, the problem with doing this, this is okay like on a connection that uh, isn't under a lot of tension, but I don't think I would trust this for actual antenna tension as a splice. It'd be perfectly fine though on like one of the down leads or something this to uh, splice it this way. So all these uh, receiving antennas, uh, the different arrays, there's several different arrays, these are not cables that come from each individual antenna system or each individual antenna in a given uh, hub but these are the cables that come from the different hubs and they they come up into the uh, contest barn or into the house and they're grounded as they come in uh, all the cables are grounded and everything's all bonded to the mains so that there's no potential differences in case there's a lightning strike or anything. And I really don't need any common mode chokes or any of that other stuff on this. It's just fine the, the uh, way it is. These cables eventually come in to a uh, box that uh, multiplexes um, all any antenna. I can pick any antenna in any direction on up to four different receivers on the same time at the same time. So I can receive on a uh, northeast-southwest beverage, I can have one receiver receiving northeast, the other receiving uh, southwest, 
at the same time or I can have all f four receivers uh, on the very same antenna in the same direction at the same time. So it's it's really like having all these antenna systems independ independently available to four different channels. In this uh, multiplexer here um, I have uh, pre-amplifiers in the, these are the only amplifiers in the system by the way. Even if the cable goes back uh, 1500 feet the only amplification is actually up in one of the buildings uh, at the uh, house end of the system. And uh, if you look at this box, all the receiving antennas come in on the left hand side and at the top you see four uh, jacks at the very top. Those jacks go out to uh, uh, different receiver lines. So this is, uh, um, there's no change at all either whether you bridge one receiver in or all four of them all the levels uh, stay the same. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, you can use some of these techniques when you put up your own beverage antennas. Thank you.